celebrate in your presence that irrespective of what is surrounding us, we were born winners, we have been born again, we are more than conquerors and we can celebrate because we are men and women of faith this morning. Our Father and our God, this gathering is unto you. As we break the bread of life, I pray that everyone that has walked in those doors or anyone who is listening, dear God, will have a share from your word because your word is life, your word is light, your word is enough. Yes, this morning I pray that each one of us will have a share of your word. We honor you, we bless you, we sit in your presence because we believe in you. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Celebrate Jesus. You can do better. Celebrate Jesus. Amen. Let's appreciate the worship team. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Appreciate the worship team. Amen. We can have our seats. I praise the Lord this morning for giving me yet another opportunity to stand before you and share his word. His word is life. His word is hope. His word is that which you are seeking for this morning. Therefore, my prayer is that you will wait on the Lord. He will not disappoint you. As we share his word, don't expect disappointment because you have an appointment with you. He's going to bless you this morning. This morning, I'm so glad because each one of us has a story. And today, if I asked any of you to tell us about your life story, you would say many things. For example, maybe you might tell us where you were born, how you were raised. You might, you might mention if you are married, you tell us about your family, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren. If you are not married, you might even tell us how come you are not right now. Everybody has a story to describe what they are this morning. But this morning, I have good news. Up to where you are, I know there are some chapters of your story which you would want to skip deliberately and intentionally. Some things you don't want to talk about. If it were possible, you would want them deleted from your life. Unfortunately, it's not possible. But this morning, you can rewrite your story. Maybe you ended up somewhere you never wanted to be. You did something you thought you have grown it. You didn't do something and you really wish you have lived a life of regret, wishing you did it. You hurt somebody you wish. Anytime you think about the person or you meet the person, you feel so bad about it, yet there's nothing you can do. You compromised your values and you know you shouldn't have done. But this morning... We serve a God of many chances. You can rewrite your story. Your story from this point on is unwritten. You can partner with God to write it. And it can be, become a better story, which one day you will love to talk about. Your story is not over. And therefore, regardless of what you have done or not done, your future is unwritten. And this morning, very briefly, I would want us to share about rewriting your story through serving. Rewriting your story through serving. Why rewrite it? Because you have more victories to win, more friends to meet, many differences to make, more of God's goodness to experience. Whether you like what you have gone through or not, there is so much. You can change your story. There are many ways of changing your story, but specifically this morning, I want us to talk about changing your story through serving. In the book of Acts chapter 9, 
we read about an apostle, Apostle Paul. When the chapter is starting, he's so vigorous. And maybe you can open for us Acts chapter 9, we'll read verse 1. Chapter 9, we'll read verse 1 before we go to the next verse, the verse you have projected. I want us to see how the chapter starts and how it ends. Acts 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priests and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way. Whether, verse 3, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. That is Paul the Apostle when we are starting chapter 9. Majority of us may be familiar with the story. And on his way after getting the letters, how he met the greater one than him. And I'm so glad nobody introduced them. The new one, it looks like they knew one another. When he found himself on the ground and he was asked, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? You wonder who told him that it is the Lord who had brought him down. But we find a person, now let's go to verse 26. After that, something changed all of a sudden in Paul's story. All Saul, at this time he was Saul. When he came to Jerusalem, now Paul has been converted, he is saved, he has gone to Ananias' house. Ananias was an apostle, but he didn't want to meet him, yet the Lord had talked to him in a dream to go and meet Saul. But it looks like everybody knew Saul because of the bad things he had done. So even when he, Ananias is being sent to Saul, he's asking the Lord, how do I go? And he's breathing fire. He wants to kill us. But the Lord insisted and asked him to go. Now he's converted. Now he can see. Now he wants to change his story through ministry, through serving. Unfortunately, it looks like his, his past is haunting him. He wants to serve, but he cannot. And that's where we find ourselves in verse 26. Now Paul is saved. He wants to serve because while he was in Damascus, where he, where he was waiting for Ananias, the Lord told Ananias that he has given Saul a ministry to go and reach out to the Gentiles and to the kings. So Paul already know, knew his destiny. He already knew his purpose to reach out to the Gentiles. But now, here he is. He wants to do it. But because of his past story, he's unable. And that's where we find ourselves in verse 26. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. That's how haunting your past can be. Those chapters you want to skip. When he came... But Ban <laughs> media, excuse me. <laughs> Let's go forward. Fast forward. Now we are in verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him. And how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Here was Paul. He was already told about his purpose. And now he had said yes to the call. He wanted to serve. But because of his past, he could not. Thank God for one friend called Barnabas. This morning, irrespective of your story, there is a friend the Lord has kept for you. You may be your only friendship away from changing your story. Barnabas was the friend that 
Paul needed to change the rest of his story. You could also be that friend about to change, about to partner with God, about to partner with Jesus to change someone's story. Barnabas risked taking Paul to the apostles, who were the leaders of the people Paul had been trying to kill in his previous life. I don't blame the apostles why they could not trust so. Even if you are him, you are them. Surely, can you entrust your, yourself to somebody who last week was killing everybody? You wouldn't. I don't blame them. But Barnabas, and the Lord has praised many Barnabas. May today be your day when you are going to meet your Barnabas who will encourage you to connect with your destiny in serving God so that you can change your story. Paul's new friend Barnabas has staked his reputation on Paul. And because the disciples knew Barnabas, they gave Paul a chance. And after that, the rest of his story, you can find it in most of the New Testament Episodes. And this morning, I want to encourage somebody. You are one friend away from a better marriage. You could be one confession away from overcoming an addiction. You are one conversation away from getting in a better shape. You are one mentor away from understanding your gifts and becoming the better reader. Paul's past was so bad until the brethren, until the apostles, instead of celebrating that now Paul has stopped persecuting them, they didn't want him in their company. But because God had destined that, he still found a way. May the Lord direct you to your destiny connector. So that the rest of your story will be aligned with your purposes. In Acts chapter 9 verse 15, the Lord had already told Ananias, that man called Paul, you better not fear him. Because I have already ordained him, he will preach me to all the Gentiles. And he did. And we all know that he did a good story. And how, how was he able to do this? He had a good friend somewhere. The Bible says in Proverbs 13 verse 20, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. It matters who we are walking with. Paul may not have been saved for a long, life, long time, but at least he knew Barnabas. Good company, a good brother, with a good reputation, and the apostles listened to him. And through him, Paul was able to connect with his destiny. I pray that you would ask God this morning what you need to do to connect with the right people. Could it be there are some people God would want you to disconnect with? Paul's life changed because of four things. Number one, he desired to serve God. After that encounter, he never looked back. He desired, actually one of the points Barnabas used to convince the apostles, he told them that Paul had preached elsewhere boldly and fearlessly. When Paul came to know about his purpose, he desired to do exactly that. And because of his desire, the Lord granted him his desire. Do you desire to do what God has asked you to do? Number two. Paul's life changed because he made an about turn in his life. He surrendered to his calling. I know this morning maybe I'm talking to some people. The Lord spoke to you. You know what you are supposed to do. But you have been so stubborn you have refused. Could it be that is why you are still there feeling so unfulfilled, feeling so bad, feeling so discouraged, and feeling so frustrated? For Paul, he made an about turn, and he decided, for this one thing I will do, woe unto me if I don't preach the word. 
those were some of his confession. How I pray that you be so much consumed by your purpose that you can say with Paul, woe unto me if I don't do what the Lord has already told me to do. Number three, Paul humbled himself. I'm imagining him. You know he was used to the other lifestyle where he had the say. That's why he could go for letters to go and persecute the Christians and he could get the letters. But now things had changed. He found himself in unfamiliar grounds where people are telling him, you cannot join us. And it, it stands that way. But Paul humbled himself. The Bible says in the book of James, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Paul humbled himself and allowed Barnabas to speak on his behalf. When you humble yourself before the Lord, when you humble yourself and ask for guidance, when you humble yourself and ask for help, when you humble yourself and do that which the Lord has assigned to you, he will lift you up. Changing your story through serving. Paul humbled himself. He connected with the right people. And we all know after this major connection which Barnabas worked for, from that point on, he had the freedom. He could move everywhere. Even when they said no, he could. But at least this time around, he was not. It is not the apostles who are opposing him. Paul connected with the right people. May the Lord help each one of us to, correct, to connect with the right people. Could you be there listening to me? And sincerely, you know you are going the wrong direction. God has already told you about your calling, but you are going the wrong way anyway. And there are enough examples in the Bible. And very quickly, I want to talk about two. In the book of Judges, we, we find this character, Samson. We know about Samson. Samson knew he was very special. He even knew he didn't have to shave his head. He knew all that. But it is so unfortunate that in chapter 14, he comes and tells his parents that he has seen a girl and he wants that girl. The parents tried to convince him that you can't get another girl. He said, that is the one I want. Yet, Samson knew that he was meant not to do that. When he became stubborn and insisted on the same, we know that sto his story never ended well. It is true he still achieved his goal he killed the Philistines, but it, the cost was so high. He died when he was bright because the Philistines scorched his eyes. He had been mocked. The Bible says that he would be called and he would, ask, he would be asked to entertain them when he's bride. He was mocked because he was stubborn. When you are stubborn to what God is leading you to do, Imagine somehow, somewhere you may still have to do it. But unfortunately, you may not like the terms. Samson still did. Because the Bible says, after he was shaved the hair, the hair started growing again. And he, the Bible says that he was able to kill more Philistines on his death than the ones he had killed earlier. But the sad, the sad part is he died with them. Do you want to die? Do you want to do what God is saying, but do it when you are bright? One brother one told, once told me, the good thing with God, he has got many chances. But if you, are, if you are so rebellious and you insist on having your way, and you fall down, and one of your tooth comes out, and you run back to God. He will receive you. But you spend the rest of your story 
minus one teeth. I want to speak to you this morning. Maybe you are listening to me and you know for sure in your heart that the road you have taken, the path you have taken is the wrong path. The Lord, the Holy Spirit has continued to warn you, but you have decided to be so stubborn, you are still insisting on your way. You are still quoting sin. The Bible says that the writer pestered Samson so much. And maybe we can read that one. I think it is Judges chapter 16 and verse 16, maybe. Let's see. Judges 16, 16. Samson continued entertaining the rider so that he may write out the secret. Yes. Kindly project it for us. With such nagging, she prodded, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. He continued following the long route and the rider nagged him to death. Imagine, he kept going many times. Before you get to, the, to where we have read, he had tried and he would refuse to tell him the story. And therefore the Philistines would come and tie him and he would be able to cut the things that were tying him. And the rider became so mad, he nagged him. Why are you giving the devil an opportunity to keep nagging you? It is so sad that the devil nagged him to death until he gave in. How I pray that you can turn around like Paul, humble yourself before the Lord, and you rewrite the rest of your story. By the time Paul was dying, his story was different. He was fearing nobody. He, he was serving at the audience of one, the king of kings. And that's why we keep on saying that towards his death, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have run the race. I have kept the faith. And awaiting me is a crown. His story changed that much through serving, through embracing his calling. And I want to call you. Maybe you are there. You are feeling so discouraged. And you have decided to give the devil a chance to nag you. You may not like the ending. It is true he killed the Philistines, but they died together. Must you wait? How I pray that this morning you can arise, say yes to your calling, and if you don't know your calling, you can arise and ask the Lord to lead you to where he wants you to serve him. He came back to God, but too late. His eyes had already been moved. He was mocked, and finally he died. We can serve the Lord with gladness. You don't have to wait for feet to push you to the corner. You can cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Allow him to lift you up and your light will keep on shining. And finally, I want us to look at this other example. Again, this unfortunate, this is another example. And the Bible calls him, he had good titles. And this is the story of Solomon the wisest man that has ever lived. But in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 11, it's a long reading, but we are going to read. Uh, 1 Kings, chapter 11, we are going to read verse 1 to 11, and then we'll be done. Before you get to verse 11, but you read at home, Solomon had been given instructions. The Lord was actually how he came into power. His kingship almost went. 
But because God had promised his father, he made a way and Solomon found himself on the throne. But he thought he can serve God at his terms. So we read. We can read together. It's so early in the morning. It's cold. I don't want you to sleep. Let's read together. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast so to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Morek, the detestable god of Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely. I want you to note that. As David, his father, had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place of Chemosh, and detestable god of Moab, and for Morek, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command, verse 11. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude, and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your subordinates. The Lord had already warned Solomon, terms and conditions apply. But at a point came, Solomon changed the story. He decided, I will serve God at my own terms. And the, he had already been warned, don't bring other women. They will turn your heart away from God. And we have just read, they did exactly that. It's so unfortunate because he wanted to please all the wives. He made gods for all of them. And unfortunately, at where we have stopped, he had done, he had annoyed God so much. The same Solomon, who God in chapter 4 had appeared and asked him, what do you need? Just tell me. He asked for wisdom. He got it. But when he got, he decided, I can still retain my wisdom and do what I want. Unfortunately, in verse 11, the Bible says that God was so angry with him and he told him, because of your attitude, this morning, how is your attitude towards what God has asked you to do? How is your attitude? Somebody said that attitude is like a punctured tire. A car has got four tires. If one of them has a puncture and has a flat tire, you are going nowhere. The attitude of his heart was so bad until God told him, I am tearing your kingdom. The same kingdom that God had snatched from somebody else who wouldn't to snatch, wanted to snatch from him. God said, I am tearing it and I'm giving it to your subordinates because of your attitude. He decided he's not going to serve God in line with his terms and conditions. And this morning, you are listening to me. The Lord has already told you what you should do and how you should do it. How is your attitude? 
Because of Solomon's attitude, the kingdom was taken away from him. How I pray that this morning you have an opportunity to do a turnaround like Paul and rewrite your story so that the end of your story will be better. For the last two people, for Samson, the end of his story was not good was not compared to the beginning. And for Solomon, the end of his story again was not as good. How I pray that you as the end of your story, you are going to rewrite it by serving God according to his terms and conditions. And your attitude is what is going to determine that. There are many attitudes towards serving God. And I want to wind up by telling you four benefits of serving the Lord. Four benefits of doing what God has asked you to do. Thank God that he's the one who gives us the assignments. It is not the pastor, but you can do that assignment with the right attitude. And the right attitude is like the one we find in the book of Ruth. We might not read it, but in the book of Ruth, chapter 2, verse 8 to 12, the Bible talks about Ruth. And um, Ruth, we know she was a Moabite. But she had decided to follow her mother-in-law, Naomi. And now they have already gone back to Bethlehem. They had nothing. And Ruth used to go and follow the people who are harvesting and would find food so that she can go and serve her mother-in-law. And God gave her such favor because of serving her mother until in chapter 2 of Ruth, verse 8 to 12, the Bible says, Okay, I had said, I would talk about the benefits of serving. Serving makes us obtain favor even from men. That is a benefit of serving God. And this is what the Bible says in the book of Ruth. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and green in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, this is Ruth, asking Boaz, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? When we serve God, we obtain favor even where we think we are not known. Even where we think we are foreigners. Ruth could not stand it. She wondered how. And she was given the answer. Boaz replied, I have been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Because Ruth served her mother-in-law, she devoted her life. I always wonder why she decided. It must have been a conviction. Because we are not told what Naomi had told her. But because of that service, Boaz just liked her and asked her not to work. Just sit here, a foreigner, and I've asked the men not to touch you. And they'll give you enough for yourself and for your mother. Serving God gives you favor. Causes you to obtain favor, even amongst people who don't know you. You are able to meet your destiny help helpers along your path of service. Ruth served Naomi, her mother-in-law, faithfully in a fallen land. This opened doors towards royalty for her. Benefit number two. Number one, I've said serving makes us obtain favor even from men. Benefit number two. You get to know and serve great people and to be known. Proverbs 22, verse 29 in New Living Translation. Proverbs 22, 29, New Living Translation. Do you see any truly competent workers? 
they will serve kings rather than working for ordinary men. When you are serving the Lord, he will make sure you find yourself in the presence of people in places you could never have entered. Serving the Lord in the area of your calling will open doors. Your gift of service will open doors, great doors, to serve great people, not ordinary people. You are able to serve great people just because you have said yes to serving the Lord. And maybe you are there listening to me and you have been thinking and maybe you found yourself in the company like this company in the book of Marakai, chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. There were some people who were talking to, amongst themselves and they were complaining. They thought serving the Lord was useless. Verse Marakai, chapter 3, 17 and 18. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possessions. I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. When you serve the Lord, the Lord will spare you from many calamities. When you serve the Lord, he will favor you just like a father. He likes when you serve the Lord with gladness, when you give him your best, not because of what you will get, but because he has said so and you love him. He will spare you from many things. Serving the Lord causes you to be spared, to receive, to become a treasured possession of the Lord, to receive compassion. He will say, spare you when you serve him. Serving the Lord becomes a platform to identify, that is the other benefit. Serving becomes a platform to identify, develop, and grow individual gifts and talents. When you have said, you know, somebody asks you to serve, you don't know how. Many a times you'll get an opportunity even to develop that talent. If people have, think you can do that one, instead of you becoming so busy disqualifying yourself, say yes, then start finding out how. Did you know people can identify a gift in you which you have never known? If people think you can do it, then say, yes, I can. And then start working on it. Identify it, develop it, and you will be surprised. One day you look back and celebrate that you said yes to that opportunity to, sell, to serve. Somebody said that serving is an opportunity which is wearing an overall. It looks like it's hard. If you are not careful, you'll find yourself complaining. How I pray you will not complain. The Lord is preparing for you a platform to develop yourself. A platform. And your gift makes room for you. Once you have furnished, you have polished your talent, you are pushed forward even to greater and better opportunities. And finally, Serving the Lord, it is an honor. It gets you to be honored by God. It is an honor to serve the Lord. The Lord can do without you. You cannot do without him. How I pray that we will embrace rewriting our story through ministry. If you read the many, the many epistles of Paul, the many books he wrote in the New Testament, he was using what he used to do then as a platform. He was no longer afraid. A time came and he would tell them. He would seize an opportunity and he would tell them how he used to do it. But now this is how I do it. And through his story, which had closed doors for him, became a stepping stone for him even to do better ministry. What you are fearing, the chapters you would want to skip in your life. If you say yes to serving the Lord, he will use the same. The, your mess will become your message. And it will open doors for you. Serving the Lord, it is an honor and not a tragedy. And the good thing is that it is the Lord who decides. But all of us have something to do. 
You can find something in the house of God. Are you listening to me this morning? And if somebody just came at an random and asked you, what do you do in this church? You have no answer. It could be a ministry behind at the background, but is there something that you do? Is there something you do for your church? Is there something you do for your family? You can be an intercessor. You can decide, I will be working at this time and I will pray for all my pastors. I will pray for all the cell leaders. I will pray for all the small group leaders. Yes, a ministry. You can have something to do and your gift will open room for you. None of us has nothing to offer in the house of God. You can rewrite your story by serving the Lord. And maybe you are listening to me. I'm talking about serving the Lord and you have never known him. But this morning, you can know him and then serve him. Because he's not interested with the services minus your heart. He wants you first of all to, that you give him your heart and then you can serve him. Are you here this morning and you have never surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ? There is an opportunity for you. Because unfortunately, you could be so busy serving the Lord at your own terms. That is very dangerous. I'm calling upon you that you can make it right. Maybe you are there, you are serving the Lord, but you know in your heart, you are not, your life is not right with God. I'm calling you to come and make an about turn and ask the Lord for another chance before it is too late. Come to Jesus. He will save you help you, bless you, and in future, he will give you eternal life. You can find something irrespective of your status, your background, your educational level, your marital status. There is room for you in the vineyard to serve the Lord. And you can serve the Lord all the way and rewrite the rest of your story. The rest of your story, you can purpose to write it with God. Irrespective of your age, yes, you can. And it is a voice from hell that you can say you are too old, you cannot serve the Lord. I've heard stories like this one. You know I've done this one for too many years. Excuse me. You serve the Lord all the way. How I pray that that will be your story. That you are willing to remain relevant for the rest of your life because you need the blessings of serving. Shall we pray? Maybe you have listened to me this morning and you know that the Holy Spirit has already put in you what you should be doing. But you know you have stubbornly said no. And maybe like Jonah, you have even taken a ship and you want to go right opposite where you are supposed to go. Like Jonah, you can call God from the belly of the fish and the Lord can give you another chance. Maybe you are there. And you know, like Samson, you are quoting with the sin. Maybe you are there. And like Solomon, you are doing exactly what the word has told you not to do. And you would want to make your life right. Are you there? I would want to pray for you. That you want that from today, you want to serve God at his terms and not your terms. Are you there? If you lift up your hand, I'll see it. And I'm going to pray for you. Thank you for those hands. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for the hands lifted up. You have already spoken to them. And they are willing to make an about turn and serve you at your terms extend grace because we are in this season of grace they are saying they are willing Lord I know you are going to help them and maybe you are there you have never given your life to Jesus so that you can be able to serve him at his terms you are there you would want to give your life to Jesus I would love to make that prayer for you if you are there you lift up your hand again we are going to pray you want to say yes to Jesus if you lift up your hand, I'll see it, and we are going to pray for you. You want to come to Jesus. Are you there? 
Father, in Jesus' name. I want to thank you this morning for your word. Your word corrects us. Your word directs us. Your word rebukes us. We have read your word. And your people have reasoned. We have all reasoned. And I want to pray for everyone that has heard. That Lord, we will align ourselves with your word. And do what you have told us to do. We desire that we may be vessels of honor in your house. We may be partners with you. Even as we rewrite and write the rest of our story. We honor you. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray.